Okay, so welcome to this next video. In this next video, what we're going to do is uh, discuss class 2 and class 3 uh, metabotropic glutamate receptors. And basically, they are coupled to the same G proteins. Um, all of these are coupled to the same thing as all of these, which is that they're coupled to either the GI G protein, in which the alpha subunit is now this alpha I subunit, or they are coupled to G0 where the alpha subunit is this alpha zero subunit. So that's why people will often write alpha I slash zero to denote that this alpha subunit can either be I or it can be zero. And again, just like Q and 11 are have pretty much the same function, I and zero have pretty much the same function as well. Okay, so let's get another piece of paper and discuss what alpha I and alpha O are going to do. Okay, so uh, let's say what we have here is, in fact, should I draw the whole thing? Yes. This is the glutamate binding domain. Here is the cysteine rich domain. Here is the transmembrane domain with seven membrane spanning alpha helices, like so. And then this is coupled with a heterotrimeric G protein, which has as its alpha subunit either I or it has O. Okay? And then uh, we don't care what the beta and the gamma subunit are. Okay, so initially this G protein is bound, uh, this alpha subunit of this heterotrimeric G protein is bound to GDP. But when glutamate binds to the glutamate binding domain, that causes a conformational change in the glutamate binding domain, which is transmitted to the um, catalytic portion of this enzyme by, enzyme by the um, cysteine rich domain. Uh, which is very rigid, and basically this becomes catalytically active and cleaves off this GDP molecule and instead binds to that alpha subunit uh, a GTP molecule. So you get GTP here bound to this alpha I slash O subunit. So this is either alpha I or it's O. And basically, once you've bound GTP to the alpha subunit, it no longer wants to associate with the beta and the gamma subunit, so they go off together. Okay, so now what is the function of the alpha I slash O subunit? And I should have labeled this. This is either an M glu R uh, class 2 or class 3. So class 2 or 3. So it's one of those two. Okay, right, so it's not class 1. So as long as you don't put M glu R 1 or M glu R 5, you'll be fine. Right, so what does this subunit do? Well, basically, most people's answer to what does it do is that it inhibits adenylyl cyclases. And that is not actually true. What it does is it inhibits calcium activation of adenylyl cyclases, specifically adenylyl cyclases 1 and 8. Okay, so let's have a look at this in a bit more detail. Right, so let's have a look at the adenylyl cyclase 8 enzyme first. So adenylyl cyclase 8. Cyclase 8. Right, so um, basically adenylyl cyclase 8 has a structure that resembles this. It sits in the cell membrane, so here it is, sitting in the cell membrane, and it has an N-terminus here, then it has its first transmembrane domain, which has six membrane-spanning alpha helices. So this is TM1. And then it has a linker between uh, TM1 and its second transmembrane domain, which is called TM2. So that's its second transmembrane domain. And then it has another great big terminal here. Right, so this linker between transmembrane domain 1 and transmembrane domain 2 is called C1. And you can divide it up into two pieces. You can divide it up into C1A and C1B. So C1A is this portion and C1B is this portion. This portion here is known as C2. And again, that can be divided into two portions, like so. This is C2B and this is C2A. And this over here is the uh, N terminus, the amino terminus. Right, okay, so adenylyl cyclase 8 is activated by uh, calcium binding to it. Uh, but calcium doesn't bind directly to it. Instead, it binds to calmodulin, uh, which 
is bound to adenylyl cyclase 8. So basically, one of the important domains that you have within adenylyl cyclase 8 is a domain on this amino terminus over here. Uh, so the amino group is over here somewhere at the start of the polypeptide. Okay, and this important domain is called the calmodulin recruitment domain. So this is the calmodulin recruitment domain. And basically what happens is that calmodulin in the unbound form binds here. So this is the calmodulin recruitment domain. Okay, so I just need to explain a few things about calmodulin then. Calmodulin is one of these proteins that binds to calcium. And basically it has a structure which in cartoons is often denoted like this. So it has this two-lobed structure. And it, each of these lobes has two calcium binding sites, like so. One of the lobes is known as the N lobe, and one of the lobes is known as the C lobe. But overall, calmodulin has six, sorry, four binding sites for calcium. Okay, so this, this structure, which has no calcium bound to it, is known as apocalmodulin. Okay, and when calcium binds to calmodulin, when calcium binds in all four sites, calmodulin changes its structure to have a more open structure, like so. It has a more dumbbell structure now, so calcium is now bound in these four sockets. So I'll colour that in to denote that the calcium has now bound to these four binding pockets. Okay, and when calcium binds to those four binding pockets, uh, this structure with calcium bound is now known as a calcium calmodulin complex calmodulin complex. Okay, right. So, how does this interact with adenylyl cyclase 8? Well, apocalmodulin binds to the calmodulin recruitment domain. So here, let's have a molecule of apocalmodulin. So that there is our molecule of apocalmodulin. So let me colour it in. So this is apocalmodulin here. And basically, apocalmodulin, which remember is calmodulin with no calcium bound to it, binds to the calmodulin recruitment domain. Now, if calcium goes up in the cell, then it binds to the four calcium binding sites of apocalmodulin, and when that happens, it's actually transferred. It no longer sticks to the calmodulin binding domain, recruitment domain, rather. Instead, it's transferred onto the C2B domain. So it's transferred onto uh, this C2B domain down here. And now it's in this calcium calmodulin state, so it's got calcium bound and it's in its more open state. And basically, what the binding of this calcium calmodulin complex to C2B causes is it causes the association of two portions of the enzyme, namely C1A with C2A here. And those two bits that I have highlighted in orange, C1A and C2A, those are the two halves of the enzyme. Um, so when these two bits come together, when they dimerize, you get the active adenylyl cyclase, which is the enzyme which turns ATP into cyclic AMP and inorganic phosphate, basic, um, cyclic AMP and pyrophosphate. Um, so basically, when calcium calmodulin binds to C2B, and it has to be transferred from the calmodulin recruitment domain. But when it's re transferred from the calmodulin recruitment domain, it, um, it um, potentiates, it makes possible the uh, dimerization of C1A and C2A, so that you get an active enzyme, basically. Okay, uh, right, so now let's look at adenylyl cyclase 8, uh, sorry, adenylyl cyclase 1. So I won't write the full name out, and this time I'll just put AC1, uh, and how it's activated by calcium, because both of these enzymes, activation by calcium, is inhibited by this alpha-IO uh, subunit bound to GTP. Okay, so, here is um, the phospholipid by there. Here is our enzyme, adenylyl cyclase 1. Now, in the case of adenylyl cyclase 1, it's slightly simpler than in the case of adenylyl cyclase 8. Okay, so here's transmembrane domain 2, and then there's the C2 domain here. Basically, in, um, in adenylyl cyclase 1, you have the same portions as you have in adenylyl cyclase 8, but this time apocalmodulin binds instead to this C1B domain. So here is our apocalmodulin bound here. So there's our apocalmodulin bound to C1B. 
Now, when calcium goes up, what happens is that that apocalmodulin uh, becomes a calcium calmodulin complex. So if I draw the conversion, let's show it here. So here is transmembrane domain 1, and now uh, here what we're going to have is a calcium calmodulin complex. But this time it doesn't move. It remains bound to C1B. But when it remains bound to C1B, now that it's a calcium calmodulin complex, it makes possible the um, the dimerization of the C1A with the C2A uh, portion. So let's denote this as our C2A. So basically you dimerize the C2A with the C1A, which remember are these two por portions that make up the active adenylyl cyclase enzyme. So let me just draw in the membrane. So here's the phospholipid by there. Right, so here what we are getting is an active enzyme, the active adenylyl cyclase enzyme. Okay, so basically when uh, calcium binds adenyl cyclase, when calcium binds to that apocalmodulin on the C1B domain, it doesn't move anymore, it remains bound to the C1B domain here. It remains there, uh, but it causes some sort of change which allows uh, the C1A domain to associate with the C2A domain and form the active adenylyl cyclase enzyme. So this is the C2A associating with the C1A. Okay, right, and that allows you to form the active enzyme. So, how do these alpha IO, uh, so, so the alpha I or the alpha O subunit bound to GTP, how do they stop this? Well, basically, what they do is they bind to the C1 region and the C2 region, and they hold them apart, basically. So this is going to come in here. So how will I show this? I'll show it on this picture. So basically, what's going to happen is that this alpha, uh, alpha I or slash O, so it's either an alpha I or it's an alpha O subunit, comes in here with its GTP, and basically it holds apart this C1 loop here, away from this C2 portion here. So basically it keeps um, these sub-portions of C1 and C2, namely C1A and C2A, firmly apart and stops them dimerizing. And that way it inhibits uh, the calcium activation of the adenylyl cyclase 1 and the adenylyl cyclase 8. So it doesn't it doesn't actually inhibit the enzyme. Instead, it blocks activation of the enzyme. Okay, so that's, maybe you might think that's a trivial difference, but it is a difference. Okay, so that's what alpha I, O, and GTP do. do. So either alpha I or alpha O with GTP bonded to them stop the calcium uh, activation of adenylyl cyclase 1 and adenylyl cyclase 8. And uh, that leads, basically, to the uh, stopping of the formation of these active adenylyl cyclase enzymes. And remember what adenylyl cyclase does. It takes in ATP and it converts it to cyclic AMP and pyrophosphate, often denoted PPI, pyrophosphate. Uh, so, uh, if you block the formation of the active enzyme, you block the formation of cyclic AMP, so cyclic AMP goes down. If cyclic AMP goes down, then that means the activation of the enzyme protein kinase A goes down, and that is then uh, the uh, second messenger structure uh, for these class 2, class 3 uh, metallotropic glutamate receptors.